Today, she is nationally recognized corporate culture expert, motivational keynote speaker, and an author helping Fortune 500 companies create a positive corporate climate where laughter and humor is encouraged and productivity soars. Today, Yvonne is here to speak on the seven habits of supremely happy people, an energizing, motivating, stress-reducing, eye-opening well session. Please welcome Yvonne Conte. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, being invited to speak with you all today about the seven habits of supremely happy people. Now, so that I can kind of figure out what, how you all are feeling, raise your hand if you can honestly say you are supremely happy all the time, because that's a sign of insanity. Uh, but how many of you are happy most of the time? Because I know I feel like I'm happy most of the time, right? And then there's a few that need a little bit of Zoloft, maybe a glass of wine. And that's okay, especially this year, this past year. But here's what I found out. There are actually three things that contribute to our overall happiness. The first one is genetics. 48% of our ability to be happy is actually inherited through our DNA. I know for some of us, that's not good news, but you know, 40% is brought on by our circumstances. The things that happen to us during the day, like, you know, you sell a few houses, man, you're really happy. Or uh, you get a new car, it makes you really happy. But then the car starts to get a little bit older. It goes through the winter. It's got stains, coffee stains, salt. Not so happy when you get in that car. 40% of the circumstances in our life has a big effect on our everyday happiness. But the good news is when the circumstance changes, so does your ability to find happiness. But the third thing that contributes to our overall happiness are simply the choices that we make. And even though it's only 12%, this is where we have all the control. And we even know that the choices that we make every day can override those negative circumstances that happen to all of us and can even take charge over our DNA, the effects of our DNA. So in order to find really true happiness, we need a bit of perspective and a little bit of common sense. And I think, you know, we get so caught up in trying to achieve. And I know that we're all salespeople. I am as well. I sell myself not on the street corner, I mean, as a speaker, I sell myself. And so I have to be, um, I have to be aggressive and I have to be, uh, you know, always looking for the next client, just like all of us do. But I think sometimes we get caught up on the nonsense that we see on TV and the nonsense that we see uh, on social media, and that can bring us down and affect our overall happiness. And so we have to kind of look at that and see how, how am I going to choose to react to this? And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I, I felt like I was addicted to uh, television when, when the election was going on because I was constantly looking at cable news. And I found that I was, my level of happiness went down a lot. And I decided one day, you know what? I'm not looking at this anymore. I'm just going to turn it off. And I, I did. And I have not gone back to watching it 24-7 like I was. And instead, I have music playing in the background during the day. And my overall happiness has really spiked. And so um, it's a choice. It's a choice we make. And even though 2020 was full of uncertainties and cancellations and change, uh, we can still find a way to be happy, even in these circumstances. And, you know, a, lo a lot of us spent a lot of time at home with the family. And I hear people complaining about that. I actually thought it was great. Um, I live in Southwest Florida. And let me tell you something. I love it here. I am so happy. And I don't care if I ever see anybody. I, I you know, I'm happy by myself. I like to be alone. I like to read. But in March of 2020, I got COVID and I got really, really sick. And uh, my daughter who lives in uh, Camillus, she drove to Florida in the middle of this horrible COVID epidemic and she brought me home. She came down, she got me, she brought me home and said, mom, you're living with us until you get better and we're gonna see doctors together. And she really took care of 
So I spent six months recovering in my daughter's home with my daughter, her husband, her two, my two grandsons, the dog, and her father-in-law who lives in the basement. So not the greatest circumstances to be in one place with all of those personalities. But you know what? It was really great. It was great because we we played board games. We we did things that we don't ordinarily do because ordinarily, you know, everybody's working and everybody's they're going to school and and everybody's busy. And so I found that boy, I really got to be a grandmother in those six months. So for me, it was really great. But I must admit, I couldn't wait back. Couldn't wait to get back to my little quiet condo here in Southwest Florida. So with all that we dealt with in the past year, how do we find happiness, true happiness in our lives, in our families, in our businesses, in our communities? Well, we're still dealing with a lot of issues that we had to, we were introduced to in the past year and a half. Well, I spent an entire month of August in Southern Italy in 2014. And I created this uh, session from what I learned on that trip because I studied the extremely happy people of this little village in Southern Italy in Calabria called Amarani. Now, nobody's ever heard of Amarani. I'd be surprised if any of you know where it is. But the people in that town really understand what true happiness is. It happens to be the town where my grandfather was born, but let me tell you how I came to go there because that is just an amazing story in and of itself. One morning I was in my kitchen and I was having a little meeting with my publicist and my phone rang. I picked it up. It was a woman that I never met in, uh, I think she was in Wichita, Kansas, and she had heard me at a conference there and she called to ask me for my meatball and sauce recipe. <laughs> and so I gave it to her and we chatted a bit and I hung up and, and my publicist, uh, Ryan says, what was that all about? And I said, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe it. People call me from all over the country for Italian recipes because they, 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 they hear me speak, they know I'm Italian and they just assume I got all the best recipes. And he said, oh, you mind, you have to write a cookbook. That's a gold mine, you know? Well, I've never been a chaser of money. I mean, I, I make a great living and I feel very blessed, but money is not my goal. My goal is to feel like I'm doing something really important and helping other people. And I know that sounds Pollyanna, but it's always been that way. Um, for me, it's worked out though, because I've always been really good at sales. And I think with sales, and, and you all know this, if, you, if, you, if your goal is to satisfy that client, to, to find out what is the thing that that client really wants, what's going to make that other person be happy, you'll be very, very successful. So he tried to convince me to write a cookbook. I didn't want to do it because I felt like that was, you know, not what I was born to do. And besides all my recipes are just down home, simple Italian recipes. They're nothing special. But he said, if you write a book about how you grew up, and the things that you learned around your dining room table. And if you talk about how you use those skills now in your work and in, with your family and so forth, and then throw some recipes in the back, it'll all work. So I agreed reluctantly to write this book. And two weeks after the book was published, I get an email from some guy in Switzerland. And I, I, I read the first part of it. It said, I believe I am your, your relative. I, I deleted it because I don't know anybody in Switzerland. Well, this guy persisted and he proceeded to send me five additional emails telling me that we were cousins, that uh, he was positive that we were related. Please respond. I beg of you all of it. And so finally I wrote back and I said, listen, buddy, I don't know anybody in Switzerland. So you, you have the wrong person. And he said in his email, but I am from Amarani. And I thought, Amarani? Nobody knows where that little town is. So I, I responded back and I said, well, how did, you, how did you find me? And he said, his father died. It sounds like a movie. 
He said, my father died. This, now we're talking on the phone. My father died. He gives me a box. In the box is pictures. He says, everybody in the box is your family in, in America. Find them, they're good people. And he said, so for 10 years, I've been looking for all the people in the United States that are my family. And I find thousands and thousands of counties all over. And I don't know who is my family and who isn't. But last week, I put the words Conti and Amarani, and your book came up number one in the search. Well, I thought, oh, this is a scam. He, he's probably some guy in another country, you know, in Africa or somewhere trying to scam me. How the heck would he ever find my book? So I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's do a Skype, because I, I heard on Dr. Phil that if you do a Skype, then they'll, they'll say no, because they don't want you to see who they are. Well, honey, we set up a Skype. And, 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 you know, I just was in my office with a cup of coffee when the, when the screen opened, 17 Italian people were in his living room with a glass of wine. Buongiorno, hey! And they were like, all oh, so happy to see me. And I just, I was shocked. I was like, what the heck? And so I realized, yes, these people, oh, and here's how I realized. He said to me, I bought your book online. And as soon as I opened it, I knew you were family because this, per this woman is my grandmother. Now, this is my book. I put this picture in the book. I don't know these people. They croaked in Italy long before I was born. But this is my great-great-grandmother, my great-great-grandfather, and my great-aunt. And my great-aunt is this man, Salvatore's grandmother. So that means his grandmother and my grandfather are brother and sister. Oh my gosh. I got on a plane. I went right to Switzerland. I get to Switzerland. These 17 cousins meet me at the airport. They got signs. They got balloons. Everybody's got a gift for me. It was really overwhelming. And then they all got in their clown cars and drove back to uh, Salvatore's house for this amazing dinner that he, his wife prepared for me. I have to tell you that I was in shock because these people were all so happy to meet me and they didn't know me from a hole in the ground, right? And, and, and most of them don't speak English. Salvatore does, but, and the younger cousins speak English, but, uh, so I get to the house and there's all these clowns on the wall, like big, big pictures of clowns on the door and on the walls. So after dinner, I said to Salvatore, I said, hey, Sal, what is the deal with all these clowns? And he said, well, we look online and we find that you are a clown. He, said, he must have seen some pictures of me with a clown nose on and he thought I was a clown. So he went out and bought all of these clown pictures. I mean, how nice is that, right? It was just amazing. And so then he surprised me and said, uh, tomorrow we're going to Italy. I want you to meet the rest of the family. And so we get on a plane, we go to Southern Italy and 56 people meet me at the airport in Italy. Again, they got flowers, they got balloons, they got presents. And they're all so happy to see me. They're all like, uh, they, they can't wait to hug me. They can't wait to kiss me. These are strangers to me. I don't know these people, even though they look like all my cousins from Utica, New York, they still were strangers to me. But I was overwhelmed and amazed at these people. Well, we went into the town and uh, I learned that everybody I came in contact with seemed to be very, very happy. And so I said to Salvatore uh, at the end of our visit, I said, I'm shocked. Are these people just trying to be happy because I'm here and I'm new or are they always like this? Because we would go into their homes, these little tiny houses, and they would have massive tables that just keep unfolding and massive amounts of food. And they're all around the table laughing and having a good time. I, I, I want to share this one with you. Many of you know what a mapina is. Mapina is a slang for napkin or, or, or uh, a, a towel or something. My grandmother used to put mapines on us when we were kids, so we didn't spill. And we're at the table and there was no napkin for me. And I don't speak much in, uh, Italian. And everybody's talking at once. And I, I looked at my aunt and I said, uh, uh, per favore, uh, uh, and I'm struggling and everybody's like looking at me like waiting for something. And I said, 
my peanut. And they all went, my peanut. And they all like raised their glasses. They were so happy that I could say an Italian word. I mean, who finds happiness in something like that? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. So I said, Salvatore, what is the secret? And he said, if you want to know the secret to happiness, you got to come back here in August. I said, why? He said, because everybody in Italy takes the month of August off and we just spend it with each other. And he said, that's when you'll really see true, true happiness and joy. And uh, so I, I booked a flight and I came back for the month of August and I spent that month in uh, Southern Florida with the family. And oh my gosh, what an eye opener that was. Like I said, this is a really small town, but it's full of people who truly know how to enjoy life. And that's what this talk today is about. And I remember one of the first things I saw was there was an older woman in, in the uh, town. It, this, you know what the streets are like in Italy, very small. And, and they walk all the time. And so we were walking downtown and I noticed this woman uh, dressed in black from head to toe, because if you're Italian, that must be the law. And uh, she just, she saw our cameras because I was, I was uh, taking camp pictures and things. And she saw our camera and she started dancing and she started smiling and talking. And I said, Salvatore, what is she saying? And he said, she just told us that she's 90 years old and she has a certificate in three things, uh, family, music, and happiness. And I'm like, wow, you know, that is exactly how these people live. Family is the most important, then music and happiness and laughter and joy. And I thought, I want that. I want that in my life. This is exactly how these people live. Now, they work very hard. And I think by American standards, I would say that my family in Italy are, are very poor people. They don't have so much that we do, but they're incredibly happy. So what's the secret? I think it's that they take the time, you know, they, they, make, they make time in their life to enjoy every morsel of food. They don't wolf it down. You know, I didn't see one single person inhale a sandwich while I was there, right? Like we do. They enjoy every morsel of food. I noticed that when we were eating, I was always the first one done. So that was a first for me to realize that maybe I'm eating too fast and not really enjoying my food to enjoy every drop of wine. I mean, they take a sip of wine and they're like, mm, you know, and every note of music. And there was so much music. What was interesting to me is that after dinner, you know how in our families you eat after dinner, the kids get up, they go upstairs, they get on the computer. You don't see them anymore. Uh, you know, the family hangs around for a little bit, but these people sit at the table at seven o'clock at night, which by the way, is my bedtime. And they stay at that table till 11 and 12 o'clock at night. And when I say they, I mean the kids too. And they, they're leaning on their, their grandma or their mama and they're, they're engaged in the conversation. It's amazing. And after dinner, they pick up a spoon and a glass or they pick up a, a bucket and they just make music and they start singing. Who, who picks up a mandolin? Somebody's got a guitar, this one's got a harmonica. It's like a movie. I mean, it's just amazing. And I think in their ability to find true joy and happiness in every aspect of their life, they are really extremely wealthy people. And I want that for me and I want it for my family. Well, the first thing I learned that seems to be a habit in Southern Italy is that they smile and greet everyone they see. When you're walking down the street, Strangers, the, the minute they see you, buongiorno, hey, buonasera. I mean, they're, they're just so happy. And it's not just, hey, like we do, right? They, they say hello with their entire bodies. They're just so happy to greet you. And I got to tell you, that makes you feel good. Now, I know we're wearing masks now. It's very difficult, but we can still smile, even though we're wearing a mask, because people can read how we're feeling in our eyes. Our eyes are, like they say, the windows to the world. And we really can give other people joy and find that joy ourselves just by smiling. 
So smile more. And you know, you go to the grocery store, if you smile at somebody, you don't know that might be the only person that smiles at them in an entire day. So imagine what you're doing for others. So to have all of that positive uh, reinforcement every time I went past somebody, it just made me feel really good to get that kind of uh, pleasantry from people that I didn't even know. Um, psychologists, if you wanna look at the, the science of this, have said that even if you're in a bad mood and you smile at someone else, it can instantly lift your spirits. And it does. I mean, if you, if you look in the mirror today, and you, you frown, really think about something miserable, and then you smile, it, you, your body changes. It's, it's interesting how that works. In fact, smiling can also strengthen your immune system. And right now we all need to have strong immune systems so to keep ourselves and our families happy. So the number one thing, my friends, to live a happier life is simply to smile more at others and at things. I mean, I take a walk here in Fort Myers every day and, uh, I, I look at flowers and I think to myself, you know, at it, it, certain times, it's December and look at these flowers and I just smile. Lord, thank you for this, this beautiful view I have, you know, whatever it might be. Look at the things around you and actually see them. That's what these people in Italy do. They don't go by anything without noticing it, without experiencing it. And I think we might be missing that a little bit in the United States. The second thing I learned was, hey, don't worry about small things. And a perfect example is, like I said, the streets in Amarini are tiny, right? Only one car can go by at a time. And if somebody wants to park, they park right in the middle of the street. And that to me was like, are you kidding me? One day in particular, we were all in the car, these little tiny cars, and uh, we were on our way to the beach. It was a beautiful day in August and we were on our way to the beach. So we're in the car and we're all crunched together. The grandmother, the grandfather, the kids, the, you know, everybody. And the car in front of us just stops. And the guy gets out and actually waves at Salvatore and Salvatore waves back. The guy goes in the building and we're stuck in a hot car. And I said, Salvatore, what, what is the deal with that guy? Can't he see that we want to get through? He goes, don't worry, Yvonne. It's fine. He's a, he's a go to see his mother. He just uh, bring her some bread. He won't be long. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And he said, Yvonne, bella vista. And he points to this beautiful view that I would have missed if he didn't point it out for me. And it was a valley full of olive trees, just gorgeous. And, and I just took a breath and I relaxed and I was okay waiting in that hot car, which is so not my personality. You know, I'm like, go, 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 you know, <laughs> but I learned to, to relax and just look at things differently while I was there. And I, I hope that you get something out of this today that helps you as well, because that was one of the most peaceful moments I spent in my life. Just looking at that. It's almost like meditation to look at something beautiful that you have never experienced before. And, and they were constantly saying to me on that first trip, oh, don't worry, Yvonne, it's okay. Non te preoccupati, relax, relax. Piano, piano, you know? And, and uh, I realized, oh my gosh, I must be like a nervous Nelly that I don't even, I didn't even realize it. But I think sometimes we get upset over the simplest of things. There were kids in that car. Now, if I put my grandsons in a hot car and had to stop for 10 minutes in the hot sun with no air conditioning and six other people in the car, I guarantee you they would have been screaming. But these kids, the little one, uh, Natalie was singing. She started singing some little Italian song and then they all were singing together. I'm like, wow, what kind of pills are these people taking, right? So a month in that town taught me, tranquil, Yvonne, relax. We also spend a lot of time, I think, as Americans, holding on to grudges. You did that to me, I'll fix you, you know? Grudges that really don't matter. I remember I used to walk into the little village and there was a wonderful coffee shop there. And I used to like to go there and just talk to people that were not family uh, to me and just see if I could carry on some kind of a conversation and find out what makes them happy. And this one man, a uh, beautiful old man said, uh, I don't hold grudges. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't continue to be angry. I said, well, how do you do that? 
And he said, well, I think about it this way. He said, I, I have people in my life who have upset me and I put their name on a potato. He writes their name on a potato with a magic marker. And I put that potato in a plastic bag and I carry it with me until I can forgive that person. Because by the time I carry it a few, time, a few days, it starts to rot, it starts to stink. And it reminds me that that's the kind of gook I'm carrying around inside me. And the guy whose name is on the potato probably doesn't even realize this is happening. So I thought that was a pretty good story to help us to understand, you know, forgive it, you know, and, and not only that, I don't know about you, but I can't figure out yet how to block people on certain social media. So it's easier to just forgive them because the weight that we're carrying spiritually and emotionally when we hold on to grudges affects us more than it does them. So forgive. Now, recently I was in a bookstore and uh, after going to Italy, you, you learn so much about what's important. Now I happen to be a, um, I love and have always loved books, but my main kind of book is a self-help books. I've learned so much from them. Well, I'm in this bookstore and I'm looking, I go right to the self-help uh, stage and, or, or, you know, area. And I see, oh my gosh, look at the titles of these books. Every one of them, if you have any common sense, you don't need these books, right? There's a, a couple of titles I wanted to share with you. One of them was how to, this cracks me up, how to build trust in relationships. How about you quit lying? That would build some trust, right? Common sense. The secret to getting along with people. I think the secret to getting along people with people is just to be nice. Be nice to people. Maybe you'll get along better. And then the, the one that I personally looked at was, it, it was something like the, the hands down best way for permanent weight loss. Listen, I've lived 70 years on this earth. You know how to lose weight? Quit eating crap and move your rear end. It's worked for me because it's common sense. There's so much that we, um, we, we want to do to better ourselves in life. And we buy tapes and we buy books and we buy, uh, you know, uh, classes and everything. And the truth is most of it is just common sense. If you stop and think about it for a minute or two, it's common sense. I know there's probably a lot of people out there that are carrying around extra COVID pounds. I did as well. But once I got back here to Florida, I started eating right. I started moving and those pounds came off. So if you used to have a little muffin top and now you've got a full blown popover, it might be time to move a little bit and to watch what you're eating. The third thing I learned is that we got to stop hanging around negative people. Dump Debbie Downer and, and Doug Downer because as you know, misery loves company. And when you hang around with people who have bad attitudes, it absolutely brings you down. I know I have, uh, I have nine sisters. But well, I got three sisters, but one's got six personalities. And, and one of them is, an, is a negative Nelly. I mean, she just complains all the time. When you call her up, you make the mistake of saying, how are you? She tells you for the whole phone call, right? I don't want to hear that your blood pressure numbers are. I don't even know what that means because I don't pay attention to that stuff. I don't want to know all that. Nobody does. But we, you know, we listen. And then you get off the phone after listening to that for an hour and, you, you know, you're feeling down. So hang around with people that are positive, happy, uplifting. You know, it just um, really does make a difference. Um, in, in, and I remember when we were in Italy, there was a man that lived behind uh, Salvatore's house because he has a house in Italy as well. And uh, we didn't meet him. And I said, who's that guy that lives in that house behind yours? And he said, oh, he, he, he likes to complain. We don't bother with him. And I thought, see, what a smart guy. He doesn't bother with him because he knows it makes a difference. People who make you laugh, it, it's the best kind of medicine you could have. And laughing, as we all know, it helps us to relax. So relax, reduces our stress, all of that. So surround yourself with happy, positive, uplifting people. Uh, remember Scott Hamilton is like some short guy that won a gold medal. He said, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. I agree 100%. So do whatever you need to do to keep yourself in a good mood and hang around good people. Um, 
there are a lot of older people here in Fort Myers, Florida, obviously, but I find them to be so funny. It's interesting how when a man gets past 75, he just doesn't care what he says. He says whatever he wants to say. And it's fun, you know, to be funny, to get a laugh. I think that's great to be that way. Um, I was coming out of church one time and this older man came over to my car. He looked like he was lost. He said, I have Alzheimer's and uh, are you my wife? And I said, oh my gosh, no, honey, I'm sorry. And he said, well, you could be. <laughs> and he let out this great big belly laughter. And, you know, I thought that was great. And I remember his wife was in the car going like this, you know, she, she probably thinks, oh my God, how many people is he going to say that to in a day, you know, but he got me to laugh. That's a, that's a wonderful um, quality to be able to make other people laugh. I figure as long as it's not hurting anyone else or breaking the law, you can do whatever you want to get a good laugh. So when you feel down the dump, just be silly. When I was in Syracuse for those six months, towards the end of my stay, I was feeling better. And so I went to, I went, did a little shop and I went to um, Target in Camillus and they had these uh, really cute retro alarm clocks. And I'm looking at these alarm clocks and I'm thinking, I know what I'm gonna do. I set them to go off at two minute intervals. There was like six of them. So every two minutes, for 12 minutes, these alarms were going off and I, I set them and then I left, I, I went back to the front of the store and I just laughed. You know, I, I, I was thinking to myself, imagine all the store people that work in the store, they're going to be like, what's going on? There's, there's alarms going off. <laughs> I don't know. It made me laugh because I just imagined them trying to figure it out. But the one thing I, I did see it was actually at Walmart because I shop at all the good stores in Camillus. And um, there was a security guard. This was during the really uh, serious times of COVID. And there was a security guard. You could only go in one, one exit, one, one uh, entrance. And, you know, that's got to be a pretty boring job. She just stood there, you know, watching people come in, making sure they had a mask. And she had sanitizer there if they wanted to use it. And I thought, boy, that's got to be the most boring job on earth. Well, not to this security guard, because she had this rubber rat that looked so real. And she put it right as you walk into Walmart, it was right there at the door. And people would come, you know, down the, the little walkway and she's standing here. And when they turned to go in the store, they saw the rat and would go, ah! you know, or whatever. And she would laugh and... And then the person would laugh and the people behind it, you know, and people needed that laughter so badly right then. What a smart thing for that woman to do. And I'm sure it improved her day too. There's so much science involved in laughter. And I know, you know, we know that if we laugh, we feel better, bottom line. That's all I really care about. But I know there are some people that they got to know the science behind it. There's actually three chemicals that when we are in a state of joy or laughter or, you know, uh, enjoying life uh, that, that are affected by the physical act of laughing. One is that your brain produces a endorphins, which gives you a feeling of, you know, how back in the 60s, <laughs> you know what I mean? You feel lifted up. Let's put it that way. And your brain produces something called oxytocin which helps you to connect with one another. So when you laugh with another person, and I found, I used to sell houses for Ryan Holmes. And if I could get the customer to laugh, I knew that I was going to sell that house. If you can laugh with people, they connect with you. I didn't realize it was because our brains are producing this chemical called oxytocin, but that's what was happening. In fact, they call it the love chemical because it connects people so much so that, you know, things happen. <laughs> the other uh, thing that is important to know about laughter is that it reduces the cortisol in our system, which we all know is connected to stress. It's called the stress hormone. And when you have cortisol in your bloodstream, you feel tense, anxious, nervous, depressed, and sad. So laughter reduces that 
improves your connection with others and makes you feel good. Why don't we laugh more? True mirthful laughter reduces the amount of cortisol in your system, helping you to be happy. Laughter really does matter. Uh, I, I, I wanna tell you too, when I was in Italy, the, there was, I went to dinner with the, all these cousins and we, none of us spoke English. So we were at this little dinner party at somebody's house, one of the cousins, and we were all just laughing. And it was interesting how you can communicate without speaking the same language. And after dinner, one of my cousins got up, went to the closet and brought out this cardboard box and it was full of wigs. And they all put these wigs on. I mean, the old people, the young people, the kids, they all put wigs on and they just goofed around and everybody was laughing and they were taking pictures. I mean, who does that, right? And everybody joined in. Nobody was too good to put the wig on. I just, I thought that was awesome. The fourth thing I learned while I was in Italy is that we need to be generous and we need to be grateful. And everyone in this town that I came across was generous and grateful, um, eager to help the next person. You know, my mother taught me that when you eat at somebody else's house, you got to help clear the table, do the dishes, blah, blah, blah. It's just the way I was taught. So as soon as I finished eating that first night, there was probably 27 people in the, in the house, in a small house. And I got up to help clear the table. And one of the aunts, she probably was 90. She came over to me. She put my hands down on the table and she said, no, no, to serve you is my honor. Wow. I couldn't believe that. And it's true. When we serve others, we just feel so good. Listen, for Lent this year, I decided I was going to do something good for someone else every single day of Lent instead of giving something up. And I, I honestly, it just makes you feel so good. Just little things. I mean, to, I saw somebody that was coming home from the grocery store. I went down, I helped them carry their groceries and just simple things. So I went I was at the shopping center where I get my groceries and there's always this homeless man there. He has a bicycle. And I thought I'm going to do something really nice, special for him. So I went through the drive through and I got a full meal for him and I brought it over and I gave it to him. And he said, thank you. That's very kind, but I'm vegan. <laughs> I'm sorry. That made me so funny. I thought to myself, what kind of homeless person is vegan? I mean, it just... So I said, well, what are you, will you take the French fries and the drink? He said, yeah, but to give the, the sandwich to somebody else. I cracked up. I thought it was funny. <laughs> but when you do things for other people, it just helps you to feel better. So, you know, open a door for somebody. I don't know. Help somebody uh, with a connection to some, you know, business event or whatever. Do something for someone else. The more you do for others, the more your life is blessed. And I find that I help young speakers all the time. I don't ask them for anything. I don't want anything from them. I just want to make them better at what they do. So as a realtor or whatever instance, if you're a bank or whatever, uh, if you can help others be as good at their job as you are at yours, you feel wonderful and you've passed on a great thing. And I, I, I want to explain about these people in Italy. The reason it's so in incredible how happy they are is because most of these people in this little town in Italy, they don't even have heat in their homes and it gets cold in the winter. They have a fireplace and in the kitchen, the fireplace is, and there's always a, what do you call a couch in or a bed in the kitchen. And I asked Salvatore about it. He said, well, in the winter time, it's too cold to be in the house. So everybody sleep in the kitchen. Can you imagine if you said to your family, we have to sleep in the kitchen this winter. I mean, right? And I, I imagine most of these people are lucky if they have high school education. They live in these small quarters. They still go to the mountain every single day for water. They have water running in the house, but it's, um, it's not drinkable. So they take big soda bottles and they climb up this mountain. I went one time with them just to see what it was like. And they get the water out of the fountain that's at, up in, in this mountainous area. And every morning the kids do that. And you never hear the kids say, I don't wanna go, it's too early. You know, our kids tend to whine and complain. My gosh, I thought, what, what in the world do these people have that we don't have that makes them so happy, so eager to do things for others, so appreciative of what they have. 
And I think that was the key. They are grateful for every small thing that they do have. And I think that might be missing in our society because we just have everything. We're so fortunate. Maybe this past year taught us a few things. I certainly hope so. But to have the ability to live with an attitude of gratitude just gives us, uh, I, I know for myself, I, I look at life differently. When I came back from Italy, I looked at life differently. But this year also forced me to look at life differently because we had gotten in a rut as a family, I'll be honest with you. You know, the boys are getting older now, they're 12 and 14, and they're on their computers all the time. And when I walk in the house, I'm lucky if they go, hi, Noni, you know? But when you walk in the house in Italy, everybody gets up, everybody hugs you on two cheeks, everybody's, you know, so happy to see you. I miss that here. And in, in the uh, COVID six months that I was up north, I realized that we got back to that a little bit. The boys were anxious to play cards with me. They wanted to play bingo. We hadn't played bingo since my father died. But during COVID, we sat around the table every night and played a board game. And guess what? We were communicating with one another. We don't do that enough. In Italy, nobody has a laptop in a coffee bar in this little town. When you go to the coffee bar here in Starbucks, everybody's got a laptop, everybody's talking on the phone. They order on the phone. They don't even talk to the clerks, the people on, you know, behind the counter. Then they don't talk to each other. They're just on their phones, they're on their computers, they're on their laptops. But in Italy, they communicate, they connect. Everybody's sitting around a table, the phones are in their pockets. They don't have a laptop because they're there to create relationship with one another. That's so important. I mean, people complain about having to be stuck in their homes. We have five-star homes. They're like resorts. You know what I mean? My daughter's home is like being in a resort. It's absolutely gorgeous. What do we have to complain about? Nothing. The fifth thing is we have to rest and relax. And these people know how to rest and relax. We went to a wedding when I was there and everybody dolls up like the, nobody's business, like they're going to the Oscars. And we go to this wedding and the wedding itself was about three hours long, just a church wedding. And after the wedding, we went back home and I, and I said, aren't we gonna go to the reception? And Salvatore said, yes. And we go to the reception, but first everybody take a nap. I'm like, take a nap. And he goes, yeah, everybody take a nap. And I'm telling you, these people laid down and in two seconds, they were asleep. Who's sleeping out on the lanai? Who's sleeping over here? And they actually fell asleep for about half an hour. And then we got up and we went to the reception. They know how to relax. My daughter, Aubrey, owns a little shop in uh, Five Plaza, whatever it's called, in Camillus, Camillus Five. And she's busy. This girl is busy 24 seven. You know, not only she's got her father-in-law living with her, she's married, she's got the kids, she's got the house and she's got this business and employees and everything. She's busy. So one night after dinner, I helped her with the dishes and we went to sit down on the couch and she took, took out her phone and she goes, okay, mom, I'm gonna take a little break and check my messages. I'm like, that's not a break. That's not a break to check your email or to check your messages. A break is when you sit and do nothing and look at the olive trees, that's a break. And I, I learned that and I do that now. And oh my gosh, my life is great. You know, I'm, I'm really happy. I don't have a lot. I, I, I'm sure everybody here that you probably have a lot more than I do of material things, but I have something that is amazing. And it's the ability to really truly live in a state of peace and happiness. And there's nothing like it. I think women, for the most part, we have a hard time trying to relax. If if you sit down on the couch, you know, to relax, you're thinking, I got to get that report in. I got to drop that off at the office. I got to buy bread. We're out of milk. We're thinking of all these things. A man, when he sits down, he's got nothing on his mind. You know, why can't we be more like that? I'm sure not all men, but you know, we need to be more like that where we could just sit on the couch and do nothing and just peace out, relax, enjoy, because we're reinforcing, uh, we're, we're regenerating our bodies and our minds. And then we can, you know, look to the future and, and be, uh, be stronger in the things that we do. Uh, 
I, I just think if, if you're overwhelmed, if you're, if you're overworked, you need to take a breath, learn how to say no to people and, um, and pick and choose. I do that now. I pick and choose where and when and with whom I want to spend my time and life is better. The sixth thing is to exercise and to sleep, to rest, renew your body, take care of your body. I think people in Italy, you know, we assume the connotation is that Italians are fat as they get older. Let me tell you something. Nobody in this town was fat. Everybody was stick thin. I felt like a, a, I felt tall. I'll tell you that because I'm five foot two and everybody was shorter than me, but, but I didn't, I didn't feel skinny because everybody there is little because they walk every day and they eat fresh vegetables and they, you know, they grow their own. They, they have their own chickens. They sleep soundly. If you want to live a happier life, you have to take care of yourself. You know how they say on the plane, take care of yourself first. And I think it is important to exercise. I remember one time I, I really wanted to get on a better exercise, uh, you know, e e example or schedule. And I joined a gym. And the first, I stepped on a treadmill. And the minute I stepped on the treadmill, I tore the meniscus in my knee. And the treadmill wasn't even on. So, you know, I figured exercise in place like that is not for me. So for me, I walk every day and I just love it. I do have some problems sleeping. I'm better at it, but I, uh, I still have some issues sleeping. I have to really work on that. And, and the, the way that they do it there is they just, they just close their eyes and they fall asleep like a rock. I think it's because they don't have all this other stuff on their mind. They're not glued to their computers. They're not glued to their phone. They don't watch a lot of TV. It's all natural kind of things. And oh my gosh, they sleep so soundly. Uh, if you have problems sleeping, take some over-the-counter medicine. That's nothing wrong with that. Just remember, never take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. The last thing I have to tell you is that what I learned in Italy is that these people have a strong faith. Now, I am going to talk about faith, but when I am, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about any specific denomination. You can be Jewish, you can be Buddhist, I don't care, but you have to believe in something. And here's why. In a study that was done at John Hopkins University, 30 patients they studied who were recovering from hip fractures and they found that those who regarded a higher power as a source of strength and comfort and who attended some kind of religious services regularly were able to walk further upon discharge and had a lower rate of depression than those who had little or no faith. So no matter what your faith is, the studies do point to a strong link between religious and spiritual practices and overall happiness, so keep the faith. In closing, I wanna tell you that as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, whatever, I think we, you know, we need to live far better than we are. We need to live better lives. We need to be better examples and role models for the next generation. And we want our families to be happy. We know they don't learn by what we tell them, they learn by watching us. So if we're walking around and we're not happy, we're not a good advertisement for others. So today I shared with you the seven personal habits that keep me pretty happy. And uh, I know that we can live a, a truly joyful life even in this horrific time in our history. Just pay attention to what makes you happy and do it more. Look at the life you have and be grateful for what you do have, the things that you are blessed with. And uh, remember that we've been given this beautiful life. So take time to enjoy it. I am going to show you, uh, I want to, I'm not sure if I can share my screen. Yes, now we see it. Okay, now you see it. All right. So that's what I want you to see. Watch this. Okay. So this is Salvatore and his family. You can see that, right? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay. So that's Salvatore and Monica and the children in Switzerland. And these are those clowns I was talking about. Remember I said they put them all over the place? They did. Look at that. I mean, it was amazing what they did. They decorated the doors. They decorated the walls. Then we went to Italy. I didn't even tell you about this. They had a huge uh, party for me in the restaurant. Look at all these beautiful faces. These are all my cousins. Cousins I didn't even know I had. And they made a beautiful cake for me with the Italian flag and the American flag. 
This is the lady that was dancing. Tell her to keep dancing. That's the one. That... <laughs> That's the lady that um, said she's 90 years old and she, she has a certificate in three things. So this is my cousin's cheese store. So I came home with a lot of cheese. And um, that's the, t the little street I was on when they made me uh, sit in the car. And that's the view of the olive trees. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. These are the wigs that my cousins were wearing uh, when we had dinner that day. Uh, absolutely no reason, they just put the wigs on. And this is the fountain uh, where we get the water. This is, uh, these are my little, my little cousins. There's the, the, the um, fireplaces. That's the wedding when we were going to the wedding and there they are sleeping. They just sit in a chair and fall asleep. It's amazing. And oh, where we're making this is Sunday morning in Italy. Everybody in the family makes macaroni. You'll notice, oh, I opened a door to a closet one time and I found all this meat hanging. <laughs> and this is the doorway of my grandfather's home. And last but not least, this is after dinner music. Is these two cookers are there microphones? Did I lose you? Oh my gosh. We're here, Yvonne. Okay. So, so, so I hope that gave you a little taste of just how really happy these people are. I mean, it's just amazing to me that in this time uh, in our lives and what's going on in the world, that these people could be so incredibly happy. So I wish that for all of you and thank you.